Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension Service here in Hernando County. And welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. This is something that we try to do every single week for people who have questions, lawn and garden questions. We've answered questions about trees and fruit trees and a lot of vegetable garden questions. My regular co-host Lily is having all kinds of internet problems this morning. So she will probably reappear in just a few minutes magically and we'll go ahead and let her back in and see if she's been able to clear up her issues. Um, but I want to introduce this week's guest star, Amanda Merrick. She's with uh, University of Florida Extension up in Marion County. So Amanda, why don't I put you on the spot and you can tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what you do basically. Sure. So my name is Amanda. I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping here in Marion County. Been in this position about three years or so. Um, we help with anything Florida Friendly, especially landscape plants. We get a lot of questions about lawns. Um, so anything with grass or ornamentals, particularly natives and Florida Friendly plants, um, especially irrigation. Um, I typically help with a lot of that. So, and my background is forest resources conservation and working for the park service. So a lot of fun with anything wildlife, native plant related, um, even tree ID, you name it. So let us know what we can do to help you out. And um, thank you, Bill, for inviting me here for today. Oh, thank you for joining us. I didn't know you had a background in forestry. Are you a certified arborist? No, I haven't gotten that certification yet. So. I need to get my, I need to study the book and make arrangements to take the test. Exactly. <laughs> Finding the time for it basically can be a little tough sometimes. Okay. Um, Patricia says in the chat box, let me remind everybody who's on here that if you have a question, that is exactly why we're here. Go ahead and look at the little chat box at the very bottom of your screen and click on that. And we'll go ahead and get to all the different questions in just a moment. So if you guys have a question, go ahead and put it in. Um, let me check my email real quick to see if we have any pictures here. Oh, we do have a picture. So I will try to screen share that. We'll see how well that works in just a moment here. Um, I do have just a couple things, so let me go ahead and screen share here real quick and go to the beginning and go to the very beginning. So just a couple little quick updates for this week. I think I got the date right correct there. Our Florida friendly landscape agent, Lily Browning, had a class the other day and she said she got a couple questions from people. And she wasn't really sure of the answer. So she told them, go ahead and tune into the virtual plant clinic and they'll answer your questions on there. So she said that somebody asked, what will kill ticks in the yard without hurting beneficials? And I'll take first crack at that and then we'll let Amanda give it a crack also. Um, when it comes to ticks in your yard, there really is no good chemical spray because what you end up having to do is spray the entire yard. And that can cause more problems than it's solving. Because if you start spraying your entire yard with a wide spectrum insecticide, and it's killing all the good bugs, the ladybugs, the beneficials, it's damaging your populations of everything from those little lizards, the little anoles, to toads, and everything else, you're gonna throw a lot of things out of whack and chances are you're probably not going to actually hit the ticks and actually kill them. So ticks can be a big problem in certain areas. Certain times of the year, they get really bad. Uh, they do hide in the grass and they wait for you to walk by. So they jump on you. They wait for your dog to walk by, a deer, a mouse. That's what ticks do. They hide out in the environment on blades of grass. And when something comes by, they jump on them. Then they attach to them, start feeding and they can transmit a lot of different diseases. So my advice is there really is no good chemical control for spraying an entire yard with to kill ticks. Amanda, do you have any suggestions with that? Yeah, well, not without hurting the beneficials, and like you said, offsetting the balance. So the biggest thing if you do have ticks in your yard is making sure that you um, put out some type of bug spray 
Um, DEET is seen, shown to be the best, the most um, effective for ticks if you spend a lot of time out there. Um, your dog, make sure that they have some type of tick uh, treatment and check yourselves regularly when you come back in the house. Um, especially those little seed ticks. I've gotten into those several times working for the parks. Um, when you get covered in those, all those, yeah, thousands of little teeny tiny babies, just get out the duct tape and start going to town. But unfortunately, there's really nothing that is also not going to hurt the beneficials. Even the organic stuff like diatomaceous earth, which really isn't very effective in Florida with our humidity, is also going to affect the beneficials. So I think you pretty much answered it, Mr. Bill. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I never thought of duct tape to get ticks off. I'll have to remember that one. A lots of fun with duct tape and seed ticks over my years. <laughs> oh, yeah, if you spend a lot of time out in the forest with forestry, I know every time I go on a hike, I'll get at least one tick. So yep. very important that you check yourself after you're out there in the woods. Yeah, they, the tick has to be bitten on you at least 24 hours, especially after 48 hours to transmit Lyme disease. Um, so really checking yourself early if you do have a tick problem to help prevent transmission of some of the diseases they carry. Exactly. And if you're worried about your dog or your pets, you need to speak with your veterinarian. They can recommend an appropriate, I know they have a lot of different um, medications out there that help, you know, prevent fleas and ticks. So talk with your veterinarian about what's going to be most appropriate for your pet. I know our dogs don't really get into ticks very often. Mm -hmm. um, they're more, people who live out in the country tend to have more, and then if you have a lot of pine trees, I know that that's very um, attractive to ticks, mm -hmm. so it's kind of on a yard-by-yard -yard situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lily said that she got a question about, what about lice on beans? And it kind of confused me for a moment. I'm thinking lice, that's not really a vegetable problem. That's a human or an animal kind of problem. But then I remembered a lot of people call aphids plant lice. So that's kind of another name for it. You don't hear that used very often in the United States. I think that's more of a, a British term. So maybe the person was, you know, and just moved here from overseas or something or refers to aphids as plant lice. So if the question is about what about aphids on beans, that makes perfect sense. Because I know that um, if you're growing green beans or pole beans, it, you, a lot of times you'll get aphids on them. For anybody who's growing any kind of black eyed peas or cow peas, aphids love them. I grew black eyed peas once before and I got a huge crop of black eyed peas. They're really good. Oh my gosh, I've never seen so many aphids in my life on the plants. But aphids are really easy to control. You want to go out there and look very, very closely first, because if you have a lot of ladybugs, ladybug larva, um, uh, green lacewing larva, other beneficial insects eating the aphids, you may not need to spray, especially if you only have a few aphids. If you do have a lot of aphids, insecticidal soap is the best treatment. You don't need anything stronger than that. You just have to be diligent and spray it frequently you know, you, it's going to take more than just one treatment to control them, but you really don't need anything stronger than that. Amanda, have you seen a lot of aphids or a lot of call-ups about aphids? A lot of aphids, especially with our Victory Garden Project with 4-H. We've got, I think, over 2,000 2, people um, all over the country and a few are all over the country and a few actually other um, countries in addition to the United States participated in that. So wow, that's um, great. we have been seeing a lot of aphids on our Victory Gardeners Facebook page for sure. So um, especially on milkweed, that's a big one. They, they tend to love milkweed. Um, so yeah, look for those beneficials. Look for the black aphids. Um, when they get mummified by parasitoids, they tend to start to turn black and they're called mummies. So if you see that, you've got a beneficial bug working in your favor. You can kind of just wait it out and see how it goes. Otherwise, use the least toxic methods first. Squish them with your hand or use like the neem oils or the horticultural soaps in the evening. Don't put it down midday in the heat of the sun. Yeah, it's a little too hot to be out there in the middle of the day anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> 
although I'm going to be doing Facebook Live in just a little bit later on um, out in my garden. And it looks like it's kind of sunny and hot out there. So that's okay. Have fun. Okay, I see Lily has magically returned to kind of join in the group. We're going over some of the questions that uh, Lily was asked the other day in one of her classes. So, and then we get the question and we get this a lot all summer long. What about lover grasshoppers? And those are those great big grasshoppers that people get in their yards. And if you have um, any kind of lilies like amaryllis, crinum lilies, something like that, lover grasshoppers will eat them up. Nope. I've never found them to actually damage a whole lot of other plants. I do have them in my yard and you'll see them sitting in the bushes, uh, sitting on the sidewalk or on the wall of the house sometimes. And everybody just goes into a panic, probably partly because they're so big, they can get, well, that'd be two, three inches long. So it's a very large insect. Um, the best way to control lover grasshoppers, and I tell people this all spring long, is go out there in March, and here in Hernando County, it's usually about uh, March 1st to 15th when they hatch, and find them right after they hatch because they're in really big groups, they're really small, they have a really thin cuticle or shell or skin on the outside. And at that point, you can just scoop them up into a bucket of soapy water, a bucket of bleach water, or spray them with insecticidal soap and you'll kill them then. If you let them go, until June, July, and August, and they get really big, fully grown. They have a really thick cuticle. There's really nothing you're gonna be able to spray on them that's gonna be very effective. Uh, and you really don't wanna go out there and spray your entire yard and upset the balance just to try to kill two or three or four or maybe even 10 grasshoppers. Mm -hmm. You have to hunt them down and dispatch them one by one by physical mechanical methods. And I don't want to get too descriptive or graphic, but there is no good chemical control after a certain point. Mm -hmm. So Amanda, I'm sure you get lots, you, you get calls every day about these too, right? We, we really do. And like you said, catching them when they're young. And I do actually have a pretty good picture. If you're curious to know what a lover is, I do actually have some good pictures, both of the nymphs and the large guys. And Mr. Bill, I'm trying to pull it up. Yep, there they are. Sure, I stopped sharing, so you can go ahead and share. All right, perfect. So let me go ahead and I've got two screens that I'm learning how to do here. So <laughs> it just takes me. practice. <laughs> Zoom practice. Yeah, Zoom practice. There you go. All right, can you see them? Yes, I can. All right, so these are the little guys that he was talking about. When they are little like this, that's the time to get them. Um, someone mentioned the Hawaiian, the purple tie plant, anything that's broad leaf and really leafy, they love it. We've got crinum lilies out here, they go for amaryllis, um, agapanthus, any of those. But this is uh, the time to get them and it's really fun. <laughs> if you wait until in the early morning, they're a little lethargic, they all tend to gather up on one plant and I have had incredible success just getting a water, a bucket of water and a little bit of dish soap and I will knock them off and they land in the bucket and they drown. And we had a really bad problem with these on our property. It was like an Egyptian plague every year you'd walk and they would just scurry. <laughs> After doing that bucket method for two seasons, we hardly saw any of the giant dinosaur adults, which are these guys. So. One of our master gardeners even recommends using a battery powered shop vac, vacuuming them up and then throwing in them in a bucket of water and dish soap. <laughs> That's a good idea. That should work pretty well. It does. It works great. And they, they die a slow, painful death and then they won't turn into the <laughs> monster. So. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is they only have one generation per year. So if every spring you, you take, you get rid of a large number of them, they don't make more generations during the year. So right. fewer are gonna mate and lay eggs. So you can, if you're diligent for two or three years in a row, I've talked to other people who said they followed that general program and now they see far fewer in their yard than they used to have. So it works. Yep, it really does. So I'm gonna stop share now so you can take it over from here. Okay. Um, 
We did have a question from Patricia, and she did send me, if I'm able to pull it up here. Let's go into the old email here, the old overflowing email. Um, she said, not sure if you do trees, but I figured I'd give it a try. Oh, we, we do everything here. Mm -hmm. So we do it all. <laughs> I'm new to planting gardening and these trees are already on my property. My mom planted the mango about five years ago. And we do, I do occasionally get a picture of a mango tree here in Hernando County that's doing really well. As a general rule, we're too far north. Mangoes do really, really well, like in Miami. Um, can you see the screen? Okay, the picture? Yep. Okay. Mangoes do really well in South Florida, uh, Miami homestead area. They grow them commercially down there. But you can have mango trees up here. It's a difficult, though, because you have to make sure they don't freeze and die in the winter. Uh, asking for any advice. And I can tell from looking at this really quickly, that's a mango. And you see the leaves have little black spots on them. The tree here doesn't look bad. I see new growth, but I see older growth that's suffering and a little yellow. And then here's a brand new baby tree here. Um, basically, it looks like the mango has a foliar fungal disease. And I can't tell exactly which fungus it has from just looking at pictures. Um, possibly Cercospora, that's a really common one. Um, you probably want to, you, what you need to do is treat it with some kind of fungicide. And when we start to get into the time of year where it's very, very hot and humid and it's warm at night and it rains a lot and it rains late in the day and at night, you're going to have a lot of fungal problems on everything from mangoes to avocados, potentially your other landscape plants. So when they start to get these spots on the leaves, it's a fungus, so you need to get a fungicide and spray on a regular basis. Make sure you get good coverage. You cover the top and the bottoms of the leaves. And what this does is it protects the small new leaves that aren't affected yet. It won't fix the old leaves. So I don't know if you can see my pointer or not, but like this leaf here that's kind of yellow and it's got spots, a fungicide won't fix that leaf, but it will help protect the new growth and the new leaves and your mango seems to overall be doing pretty well. Now, whether it's going to flower and get mangoes or not, I don't know, because what happens is every winter we do get a couple cold nights, damages the tree, maybe freezes it back a little bit. So the tree in the spring and summer is trying to regrow and they never get to the point where they flower and get fruit. Although somebody sent me an email once before and they said, I just bought a house in Spring Hill what is this tree? And I open up the picture and it's a mango, a great big, beautiful, like grocery store mango. I'm like, oh my gosh, you have a mango and it has fruit. Congratulations. You're, you're one of the few fortunate ones here that are able to do that. So it can happen, but not very often. But I would recommend just a fungicide for those leaf spots. Any other advice? I mean, do you have any, anybody with mangoes successfully that far north? No, sir. <laughs> yeah, so see, even up in Marion County, which is just Ocala, just a little bit north of here, it gets a little bit too cold consistently in the winter. Right. So let's go and see if we have any other questions we can handle here. Um. I see that uh, the grasshoppers do like to eat the Hawaiian tea plant or Thai plant. Teresa says, if I purchase praying mantis cocoons or ladybugs, how can I ensure they will stay in my yard? I'll let you handle that one. Oh, well, you got to give them food. <laughs> <laughs> so if you got pests, they'll stick around. Otherwise, you really can't put collar on, collars on them to keep them in your yard. So they're going to go where the food is. So if you've got pests, they hopefully will stay. Otherwise, if you've got a recurring issue each season, you can keep purchasing the, the praying mantises, which are awesome natural predators and the ladybugs. Yeah, there's with using them out in the yard, there's a couple issues with that. Buying beneficial insects and releasing them if you have a greenhouse operation works really well. 
because a greenhouse has doors and windows. You can keep them in, they're not going anywhere. And if you have a pest that comes in, you can release the beneficials, they take care of the pest, they knock the population down, everything works great. If you release, if you buy, let's say, ladybugs and release them in your yard, if they want to, they're gonna fly away. Mm -hmm. And there's no way to convince them otherwise. Mm -hmm. If they wanna stay in your yard because you do have plenty of aphids or scales or white flies or whatever they're interested in, they're gonna stay. But on the other hand, if you have a yard where you have plants and you have, like we talked earlier, plant lice, aphids, or scales or something, all the beneficials in your neighborhood can and usually will fly into your yard. If you make a kind of comforting, comfortable, welcoming situation for them. So if you don't overuse pesticides, if you have places for them to live in, a food supply, um, plants that have little tiny flowers, weeds and native plants are good for that because they need a certain amount of pollen. All the ladybugs in your neighborhood are going to come to your heart, your yard and stay there and eat your pests. So there really is no way to talk to them and convince them to stay or not stay. Right. And especially if you order ladybugs, they usually send them in nymphs. And make sure when just go on your yard and scout because the nymphs do not look anything like ladybugs. They look like tiny little dragon type things. Yeah. So go online and look up a nymph first of all because you may already have some out there. But when you order them, that's usually what they send. So you can put them right on the infected plant. But like Bill said, once they turn into adults, can't do much to keep them from flying off. But the nymphs are the hungry guys. Those, those are the ones that really eat the aphids especially. So hopefully they won't crawl off too far if you put them right where the problem is. Exactly. So Patricia said she's, she is in South Florida. So both the mango and avocado flowered and fruited, but then they fell off during a bad storm, which can happen. We get bad storms and they break branches, they blow over trees, they damage a lot uh, when they were little. So uh, Patricia, if you want to go back in the chat box and tell me like what town or what county you live in, might give me a better idea about how well they're going to do. The further south you are, the better they do. And for anybody, oh, Broward County? Oh, yeah, yeah, you can grow mangoes and avocados just fine down there. I know for anybody who's ever visited Homestead, that's one of my favorite places to go. I love the farmer's market down there. Oh my gosh, you want to see tropical fruit that you've never seen before for sale? They have it. <laughs> and they, the people grow avocados and mangoes and star fruit and everything else right in the backyard. They grow like weeds. I'm so jealous. I wish I could here. <laughs> um, I can grow vegetables here, but not mangoes, unfortunately. So um, yeah, Patricia, down there, you definitely will get fungal diseases. You will need to use a fungicide that's really going to help the tree do better. Um, you need to go to the store and pick a fungicide that's labeled to be used on fruit trees. So something like a liquid copper is probably labeled for it. Liquid copper is used on citrus and a lot of other, a wide variety of different plants. It's been used for many, many, many years. There's another product called Daconil, D-A-C-O-N-I-L. And that's labeled for a lot of vegetables. They use it for growing peanuts. Peanut growers use it. And it's probably labeled for fruit trees also. So those are good things to look at. Carol asks, do geckos eat pests? She's probably thinking about the anoles, the little lizards. We have many geckos in our lanai and hope they are beneficial to the plants. <laughs> you want to hit? Who wants to handle that one? Lily, you want to jump in here? I guess your uh, microphone should be working. and talk about those. I get so many questions from people. Oh, how do I get rid of those geckos or lizards in my lanai? I hate them. We do too. <laughs> we all do, I think. Common question. I certainly wouldn't want to get rid of them. Um, I've seen them eat roaches. And since roaches are about the only insect that I can't stand, I'm quite <laughs> happy with that. Um, where I live, uh, North Hernando, I don't think I have enough um, geckos. I don't see very many. When I used to live more um, in central Brooksville, they were all over the place. But they're just, they're just part of living in Florida. I mean, I wouldn't want to get rid of them. And yes, they do eat 
insects. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, they do. I, I tell people the um, two things that they do all day long is they make babies and eat bugs. Yeah, one of our master gardeners has an awesome picture of one with one of those lubbers in its mouth. It's excellent. <laughs> See, so if you hate lubbers, you need to learn to love the little lizards. Yeah. Um, I used to live over in Volusia County and I had a large vegetable garden. I enjoyed just sitting out there pulling weeds, enjoying the peace and quiet. And I had the native six line skinks in the backyard. Those are awesome. A lot of them back there. Mm -hmm. Um, there one day quietly pulling weeds and I hear crunch, crunch, crunch. I look up and I see one of them sprint about 10 feet and bam, hit a, a, a beetle and grab a hold of it and eat it. I'm thinking, yeah, way to nice. go. <laughs> Free pest control. You're doing all the work for me. So those lizards are very, very beneficial. Um, you really don't want to be you don't ever want to try to spray for them. There are no sprays or label for that. Mm -mm. Uh, if they get in the house, you could do the old cup and piece of cardboard trick. That's what I have to do to put a cup over them, slide the cardboard underneath it, lift them up and take them back outside. So I get screamed at to do that on a regular basis. <laughs> So I, I don't think they're directly beneficial to plants. Correct me if I'm wrong, but they do eat pests, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, they're not and directly beneficial that. so much to the plants, but they, they do get they do eat roaches, they eat beetles, mm -hmm. the different kind of th other things that you don't want in your lodi. Mm -hmm. Bill, don't you have a story about um, how the native anoles and the non-native ones kind of worked things out as to where they live? in the trees or something? They do. We have the native Florida green anole, and Amanda, you can jump in and correct me. You know more about wildlife than I do. That's not my area of expertise. But we have the native ones, and then the, the brown ones that people call chameleons or geckos usually are Cuban anoles. And technically, they're non-native, they're invasive, but they're here to stay. They're not going anywhere. So the invasive ones like to operate and live on the ground and very low in plants and bushes. But the Florida green anoles like to live further up in your trees and bushes. And in a lot of people's yards, if you go outdoors and start looking real closely, you're gonna find that you have both. And like in my house in Volusia County, I had three different kinds in the backyard and I have no idea why. Uh, I did have kind of a little wildlife area, I guess, which I guess helps. Mm -hmm. I had the six line skinks, which is the same type of lizard. They tend to be a little bit longer and they're kind of like a fluorescent bluish and they have six lines, kind of bluish purplish lines down their back. So I actually had three different species nice. that I know of and I probably had more out there between skinks and um, some of the ones that burrow in the ground a little bit. I, I'm sure I had a little bit more. Yeah, the fence lizards are really awesome. Have you seen that they're hard to find? They tend to blend in with the trunks of trees or wood fences really, really well. But the fence lizard is another native one. Looks like a little miniature dragon, but those are an excellent beneficial too. Yeah, we need to do a class on all the different native lizards that you may encounter in your backyard. Good so. idea. I'll get, a, I'll get a hold of you about that. Perfect. <laughs> See, I like when people give me ideas because I'll sit here and start thinking about what I'm going to do classes on. I can't think of anything very good. So Ronald asked about what about fungus on palm trees? Palm trees rarely get fungal problems. So I went ahead and put in the chat box my email, wlester at ufl.edu. So if anybody wants to write that down and email me pictures of problems you might have on palm trees, it might be a little easier to tell you what's going on from a picture because palm trees very, very frequently get nutrient deficiencies, but they rarely get a true fungus on them, very rarely. At least one that you can treat. Many of the, the fungal diseases that they can get hit with are lethal, lethal and don't have a treatment anyway. Right. I was going to ask if it's a cabbage palm, then we know what could potentially be the problem there. 
Yeah, if you get something like lethal bronzing or fusarium, it will kill your palm tree relatively quickly. It might take a few months. Fusarium could go as quick as like a few weeks in a queen palm tree. There's no treatment for those. But if you're starting to see unusual things on the leaves, if you want to send me pictures, you know, we'll figure out what it is from that. And then uh, Judy asked once again about what about lovers? I think we already talked about lovers um, that keep eating the plants on my leaves. Right now, this time of year, um, there is no spray that's very good for them. I know people historically would go, just go out and they plan on, oh, I got to spray my entire yard with something to take care of um, fleas or lover grasshoppers or something. That does not work very well. Mm -hmm. Now, once they're full grown adults, which they are at this time of the year, honestly, just, just squishing them, throwing them over at your neighbor's fence. That That's works. That's pretty much the only thing. <laughs> <laughs> they don't fly. Even though they have wings, they don't fly very well. Mm -mm. So if you catch them and throw them as hard as you can over the neighbor's fence, they're not coming back to your yard. So just a thought. And Ronald said, how to control Cuban tree frogs. And then he said, with the, fan, oh, the palm tree is a European fan palm. So like I said, send me pictures. Palms get unusual stuff on their leaves that's really not a true fungus. It can be, a, we call them funny palm things. So palms do funny palm things with their trunks and leaves. And it's just a palm thing. It's nothing wrong, nothing you can treat. So um, Cuban tree frogs, frogs, Amanda, I'll let you talk about that. Uh, my arch nemesis. So we, we, <laughs> we bought a house last year. And if you have a way to control Cuban tree frogs or come up with one, please let me know. Because to my knowledge, there, there are some traps that you can build, usually just like a PVC pipe and have them go into it, but there's really not a whole lot you can do. There's no sprays that we recommend. Please don't use mothballs. Some people swear by mothballs yeah. for snakes or frogs. They're not labeled for that purpose and they're very toxic. So there are some traps that you can search online and build. I can't say as to how effective they are, um, but they are attracted to light, especially at night when bugs are coming up to the light. So if you have a light that you have on a porch or lanai, turn that off at night, that can help. But we purchased a house yesterday with a pool and the drain is a long PVC pipe. And we had Cuban tree frogs raising hundreds of babies in that pipe and keeping me up all night long. So <laughs> um, this year I haven't seen them as bad, thankfully, and I don't know why, um, but the biggest thing with Cubans is try to avoid where they might live and breathe, such as pipes or the underside of, of lights. Um, we even see them sometimes in the hinges of car trunks. They're really not picky, so any little hole or crevice um, can certainly, if you can block it or um, change it in a way that they can get up in there and breed and hide, that's really the only thing that I'm aware of. Yeah, trying to find where they hide during the day and, you know, get rid of them at that point helps. Right. Uh, limiting the standing water in your yard because when they start to lay eggs and make tadpoles, they make millions of them. Yes, they do. <laughs> and that's really good to help control mosquitoes also. You don't want standing water around for mosquitoes too. Amanda, could you tell us how to tell the difference between a Cuban tree frog and a native tree good frog? Yeah, good question. And some of them are a little bit tricky, but the Cuban tree frogs tend to be bigger. They can be various colors, so don't go by the color alone. I've seen some that are almost white, and I've seen some that are a dark brown, almost a green color. But the key thing with them is their feet. Their feet are very, very distinct. They got really, really long fingers with really wide pads on their toes, um, especially they have like one middle finger. Kind of looks like they're giving you the finger, honestly. So if you see one big, long middle finger with a large pad, that is mo usually most definitely a Cuban tree frog. And you can always send your local extension service pictures too if you really want positive ID. The natives are typically 
depending on what they are, there's like these little teeny tiny green tree frogs that are adorable that don't cause any problems, or there's also toads. Um, so, but if you see that long finger with the really big pad, that's usually mm -hmm. a very key indicator that it's a Cuban tree frog. Um, and I think there's also something with the eyes too, isn't there, Bill or Lily? Some distinct feature about that as well. I think there is, but it's not as easy to tell. I mean, the toes really do give it away. Yeah, the natives usually have some type of black line behind the eye, and the Cubans yeah. do not, I believe. Right, right. Yeah, and one of the ways you can deal with them that I've always heard is if you, you know, you catch one. Um, you can always put it in a plastic bag and put it in your freezer. Let it go night night for a little while, you know, and twenty four hours or so. That's so kind of longer than that. I've, I've heard stories of people putting them in the fridge for a day or even a couple of days and they return to life. So we have a oh, few in our maybe. yeah we have a few yeah. in our freezer at the office. So don't eat anything out of the extension <laughs> freezers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we have weird things in our freezer at the office also. You don't want to go in our freezer either. <laughs> um, yeah, I know University of Florida has really good information online, so you can Google that. That's what I go by. I go by the toes, the toe pads, the round part are really large. And I think all native Florida frogs top out at maybe three inches mm -hmm. for the tree frogs. So if you ever see anything that's really, really big, that's a good indication that it's a Cuban. Right. Because we don't have any other really big tree frogs here in Florida. And the big thing about them is not only do they compete for food with our native frogs, they actually eat our native yeah. frogs as food. So that is why they're a problem. Yeah. Okay. I think I see one final question here from Patricia who lives in, I believe, Broward County, she said earlier. Mm -hmm. um, do the extension offices have any programs to help with getting rid of invasives? I have two carrot wood trees on the property. To the best of my knowledge, I know here in Hernando County, we don't have any programs that actually will go out and remove the trees for you. I don't think forestry does either. Uh, if it's on your property, you're going to have to hire a private company to take care of it. If you're talking about invasive trees, and I'm not too familiar with carrot wood trees. I think they're a problem further south of here. Here we have Brazilian pepper and white lead tree, which are a big problem. With those trees, if you go out or if you pay a company to cut them down, if all you do is you cut it down, all that does, it makes it angry. And it will grow right back, but now with 10 sprouts instead of just one. So what you have to do is you have to have a company that knows what they're doing, and they cut the tree down at ground level, and they promptly spray it with the correct herbicide at the correct concentration. That will kill the stump because it sucks the herbicide in right away, and it ideally, hopefully, won't grow back. Mm -hmm. So just cutting them down is just going to make a mat and they're going to grow back bigger and better in like six months. You're going to have even more of them. So if you're dealing with a professional company to do something like that, you need to make sure they know how to deal with it. Otherwise you're paying for, you know, not getting the problem solved. But as far as I know, um, Amanda, I guess Marion County, you don't, know of any programs that actually remove them for people? We don't, yeah, we're, we're purely just educational purposes. Um, I do believe if you're a, a large lander, and I'm a uh, landowner, and I'm talking, you know, you know, 100 or so acres or more, there are some um, programs, usually there are programs provided by forest resources, um, the forestry division, but usually no extension, we're primarily just education. Um, so if you do have trees, like Bill said, um, cut stump, spray the stump immediately. If it's too large, you can also um, girdle the tree, either a chainsaw and just girdle all around it. It's not going to kill the tree immediately. It's going to take some time and also make sure it's nowhere near a, a house or a structure or where it can cause some harm because it will slowly die and eventually will fall on its own if cutting it's not uh, feasible. But Cutting it and spraying it really is the best bet. And no, we don't have any programs here that, that do that for you, just education. 
Yeah, and if you and need if more you, specific you, advice, you can contact your extension office down there in Broward County. I'm sure they'd have to help you mm -hmm. out. Our, our rules for, um, we have certain companies that Bill has trained to help remove the uh, Brazilian pepper in the white lead tree. And one of the um, rules that they have, that these professional companies have, is once you take it all down and have done the spraying, when you're taking the trees to the landfill, you have to tarp or cover those trees. And that would be the same if a homeowner tried it, because otherwise then you're just gonna have your carrot wood trees between everywhere between your house and the landfill. So you have to be careful how you're dealing with what you've removed as well, that you That's don't spread it out. I hadn't mm -hmm. heard of that, because even in our um, mulch, like be careful with free mulches from utilities, especially. Yep. Um, or anyone, because we actually used free mulch um, after a hurricane for a demonstration garden. Um, and yeah, we ended up with Chinese tallow seeds popping up oh. everywhere in our free mulch. So yeah, make sure with, with um, transporting invasives and then with that free mulch, what seeds are actually in it. Yes, I got some compost made from uh, tree mulch that was brought by um, tree services. It came from a local um, organic uh, CSA farm. And I was putting together my garden. He gave me some compost. I worked it in. And now I have air potato vine coming up in three different spots. So Yay! I'll take pictures of that and show how it can even hold over through the composting process. Wow. So yeah, it doesn't these things quite are get for a reason. They're, they're devious and they're able to do amazing things. I want those pictures, Bill. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I noticed one air potato vine pop up in my yard. It's like, where did that come from? Wow. And in a container, and I still have one bucket left over of the compost I hadn't used yet, and it has a vine coming up out of it. Nice. So, yes, I need, to, uh, that, I need to write something about that. Or yeah, don't compost invasives. <laughs> yes, amazing invasives. Yeah, that's a really good. I need to put together just a whole series because I've looked at people who have gotten their um, Brazilian pepper cut down before and it boom and like you'll cut down one tree and you see just a cut stump and then 10 shoots will come up. Tallow does the same thing and just, like you exactly. said just gets angry. <laughs> yeah just makes it mad. So we got one last quick question here and this is a really easy one because I have one in my backyard. <clears throat> is nocturnal jasmine, I assume that's night blooming jasmine, invasive no it's beautiful it's my wife's favorite plant because it blooms and smells really fragrant in the summer at night and if you, if you have one it does bloom a lot at night and if you go out there with a flashlight you'll see insects and you'll see every moth in your county and you'll see all you'll see um cuban tree frogs eating the moths and you'll see everything out there on your night blooming jasmine plant. So very good for wildlife, um, very nice landscape plant. And no, it's not invasive. It doesn't spread, it's not on the list. So we have any other? Uh... Oh, Bill, did you freeze? Uh-oh. Yeah, Oh, there you are. I probably got hung up a little bit there with my internet, so <laughs> just want to say thank you, everybody, for joining in and helping. Yes, Lily? Um, I'm sorry I'm outside and you hear construction noises, but I'm dealing with internet issues, too, <laughs> but I wanted to remind everyone next Wednesday, the 24th, at 9. Usually my classes are at 10. This class will be at 9. It's a virtual field trip to Rita Grant's house. She has a small native nursery and she's gonna show us the plants that attract butterflies and hummingbirds and talk about them. So all you have to do for that is to be on my Facebook page, FFL program, Hernando FFL program um, at nine o'clock on next Wednesday. There's no links involved when we do Facebook live and um, you can go on that virtual field trip with me, but that'll be at nine cool. because just because I don't want to start getting hot by doing it at 10. So, so we're doing it at nine. It'll be really exciting. Well, you know, it's still going to be hot at nine. 
I know, but not as hot. Okay. <laughs> Just want to be sure to point that out. <laughs> well, Amanda, thank you so much for joining us today. It we'll was have fun. To have thank you. Come back again sometime. Yeah, see, this is fun. You never know what kind of questions you're going to get. No, it was a good time. So thanks for inviting me. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Yes, thank you. Thank you.